certainly want to express our appreciation today for the presence of each one. We are thrilled that you are here with us today, and our prayer is that in everything that we do, it will be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of our God, that all of us can say it's been good to have been here. We're particularly happy to have you that are visiting with us, whether you're someone that has visited in the past or this is the first time, our prayer is that you'll be blessed by the study that we'll engage in at this time. The reading just a moment ago was from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, where the Apostle Paul talks about laying aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. This is a very familiar passage. You've heard it read many times and preached on, on numerous occasions. Here the Apostle says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Olympic Games at that time, of course, had people from all over the world at that time who would come to race and they would uh, prepare themselves in advance by strengthening the body in whatever way they could, lifting weights and putting weights on their feet so that their feet would feel lighter when they, they took off the weights and began to run. And what the apostle is suggest, saying here that that we ought not to try to run with the weights. No matter how much we have become accustomed to or used the weights in the past, we ought not to try to run with the weights. We ought to take those things off after they've strengthened the body and run with patience the race that is set before us. And that the goal is we're not to be looking around everywhere at all of the things of this life. We ought to look toward the object and the goal that is, we are to run with patience the race set before us, looking to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. He endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God on high. And we look forward to the occasion when we can be with him forever and forever. So let's talk about the matter of laying aside weights. But first of all, I want to suggest to you it is important for us to be strong. You may guess who this particular fellow is here. And this is a picture, supposedly, a drawing of Samson, strongest man that ever lived. This strong man was a man who was strong physically. He was not strong spiritually. Indeed, he was a very weak person. He gave in to the things of the flesh, and he was one who simply did not become strong in that kind of way. We need to be people who are strong in every way that we possibly can. In the 16th chapter of the book of Judges, speaking of Samson, of course he was a, a man that God had planned for and talked to his parents about, and he was a Nazarite, and he was not to cut his hair, and he became an extraordinarily strong individual from a physical standpoint. But as it says here in just one example in Jude, Judges rather, chapter 16 and verse 3, that Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight. He'd gone out among the Philistines and was at a Philistine city. And he says, arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts that went with them, the bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them away to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Here was a tremendous task. No one else could possibly have done what Samson did on that occasion to show his great strength. It's shown in many, many ways. He took the uh, jawbone of an ass and killed thousands uh, of those uh, Philistines. He was one who was a judge over God's people. If he had been if he had been as strong spiritually as he was physically, he would have been a great asset to the kingdom at that particular time. But he was one who simply was not strong spiritually. He was very, very weak. He fell in love with a foreign woman, a woman by the name of Delilah. And you, of course, know that God's people were not to, they were not to marry outside of Israel. And 
Uh, she was one who had no good intentions with regard to him. She was trying to find out where in his strength lie. And you remember how that she, uh, she tried to get him to tell her, but he would not tell her where his strength lie. And he began to tell her a series of things that really were not true. That if he was born, bound with a certain kind of vine, that he would be as weak as any other man. And she, while he was asleep, bound him with this, with this vine and said to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon thee. And he broke the vine and went out to meet the Philistines who weren't there, of course. But on the other hand, again, at a different time, he said, if you bind me with new ropes, I will not, uh, I'll be as weak as any man. And uh, she cried after he, she had done this, that he didn't really love her and her uh, crocodile tears began to touch the heart of Samson. He told her if his hair, he's getting close to the truth now, if his hair was woven in a loom, that he would uh, be just as weak as an ordinary man. And so she, while he was asleep, wove his hair into the loom, and he got up when she said, the Philistines are upon thee. He got up and took the loom and the beam that it was attached to and drug it all outside as he went out to meet the Philistines. She really said, Samson, you just don't love him. And her crocodile tears touched the heart of this man. And finally, he, against his better judgment, told her the truth of the matter, that he was a Nazarite, and if his hair was cut off, it had never been cut. If his hair was cut off, he'd be as weak as any other man. She got him to sleep and she called the barbers. The barbers came in and they cut off his long hair. And then when she cried for Samson, awake, for the Philistines are upon thee, the Bible says he got up and shook himself. Why did he do this? The Bible says he got up and shook himself for he knew not that virtue had gone out from him. He didn't know anything had happened. Now he'd been asleep, but he'd been asleep more than just physically. He'd been asleep spiritually. Wasn't aware of what happened. And just like a great big animal gets up after wallowing in the dust like an elephant or a big horse or something like that, gets up and shakes himself, uh, that's what Samson was trying to do, but he didn't realize what had happened. They took him, punched out his eyes, made him uh, made him grind in the mill and finally this picture after his hair grows out again he is able to uh, have strength and he brings down the temple and all of the people that were in there and kill more Philistines the enemies of God's people in his death than he had killed in all of his life but it's important it's important for us to be strong it's nice to be strong physically, but it's much more important for us to be strong spiritually. And so we're going to talk about the matter of being strong in all of these ways. We have read the passage here from, from the 16th chapter of the book of Judges. The statement in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8 says, As we look on down to it, bodily exercise profiteth a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that is... It now is and of that which is to come. It's good for us to get out and get exercise. It's good to go to the gym. It's good to go down to the lake and, and walk the lake and be strong physically. It says it bodily exercise profiteth a little. Doesn't say not anything at all. But godliness is profitable unto all things. So what should we be? We should strive to be people who are strong spiritually. The statement in Joshua 1 and verse 7, when Joshua had been called to take the leadership of God's people at the death of Moses, we find the Lord saying to Joshua here in verse 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do all according to the law. What kind of strength is he talking about? He's not talking about physical strength. He's talking about spiritual strength. He was going to have to be strong to observe to do all of the law, which Moses, thy servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. He was going to have to be one that stood for what was right. We live in a political day today where 
politicians are wishy-washy, willy-nilly. They turn to the right. They turn to the left. They do whatever is necessary to get themselves elected. But here on this case, the great leader of God's people was going to have to follow God's law and God's will and not turn to the right or to the left. And we're to be strong in our day and age. Notice that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's talking about that we are to be people that are physically strong. Now I said the people who practice with those weights wouldn't get out and run with them. Here is a fellow who has his weights and he's trying to run. I know that looks a little bit ridiculous, but that's the way some people are. They want to take their weights with them when they're trying to run the race, the Christian race. There are a number of things that people certainly cannot afford to take. We cannot afford to take doubt or unbelief. The Bible teaches that we're to have faith. It is impossible to, to be well-pleasing unto God, for he that cometh unto it, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We are not to try to carry the weight of the world with us, the doubts and the fears and all of those things. We simply cannot afford to take with us sinful habits. We need to lay aside those sinful habits in order that we can run the Christian race. In Ephesians, rather, in John 5 and verse 24, it says, If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. The Lord says, Where I am, there you cannot come. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we're told that we walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot doubt, we cannot fear, we cannot people that be people that are involved in sinful habits, in the works of the flesh, we're going to have to lay aside the works of the flesh and put on the fruit of the Spirit, as we suggested in Bible class this morning. We cannot afford, on the other hand, to try to carry with us evil speech and things that we ought not to say. We're going to be judged by our speech, by our thoughts and by our speech. We will we be condemned? It is important for us to lay aside all of those things. All right, let's talk about what are we are to lay aside. Unbelief, yes. On the other hand, when they were told on Pentecost that they had crucified the Lord of glory, here are people who had failed to believe in Jesus Christ. They had not believed, but we find when they were cut to the heart, Peter had preached to them, and they said, Men and brethren, what must we do? He had told them they'd crucified the Lord of glory. They were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Jesus had pointed the importance of repentance in Acts chapter 13 and verse 3. Incidentally, the next verse down from that, the fifth verse, says exactly the same thing. It's important to repent. It is saying here, except you repent, you shall perish. Preachers have preached from this time and again on the idea of turn or burn. We're going to have to turn in repentance or we're going to perish at the end of the way. They were to repent and to be baptized. When we find in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, here Paul is speaking to those learned Athenians. He said, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We can't get by with just wishy-washy, willy-nilly sort of half-hearted Christianity. We're going to have to be the kind of people that turn from the world and all of the things that are a part of that. And notice with me also, not only are we to lay aside unbelief and impenitence, but we ought to lay aside inconsistency. There are some people who claim to be Christians who are on again and off again. You never know whether they're going to be in services or not going to be in services. It all depends on whether they're really feeling religious or not. In James 1 and verse 10 it says, Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. We need to be careful. We cannot be people who tell dirty jokes, cursing and a filthy speech, and at the same, same time trying to teach people the gospel of Christ. We need to be people who are faithful and consistent in all of our actions. 
not just religious on the Lord's day, but every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, faithful to the Lord. He was a man by the name of Demas that had been a worker with Paul in the gospel and had even joined him in the writing of some of the New Testament epistles. But now Paul is saying, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians, to Galatia, Titus, unto Dalmatha. Paul felt alone at this particular time. But we're not to love the world. Love not the world, Jesus said, neither the things that are in the world. We need to lay aside that which makes us inconsistent in faithful living for Christ. And what else should we lay aside? We should lay aside all denials. It is important for us to confess our faith in Christ. Peter had confessed Christ, you remember, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 18, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But later he denied the Lord, as he denied him three times just before the crucifixion of our Lord, because he was afraid of those who had arrested him. He was afraid of the Sanhedrin and the high priests and their power and all of that. But the scripture says to us, Whosoever shall deny me, these are the words of the Lord himself, he said, Him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. We are to be courageous. We are to stand for what's right, stand up for the truth of God's word. Not only are we to be people that are willing to confess, but we're told in the, 12th the 30th verse of the 12th chapter, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Some people want to straddle the fence. We can't afford to straddle the fence. We can't try to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. We're to be people that are faithful to that which we've confessed and to continue to confess our Lord as we go along through life. Disobedience is a serious problem. The Bible teaches that not only are we to believe the truth, we are to obey the truth. Remember that it says in Matthew chapter 7 that not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, does what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. It's important to do his will. Blessed are they that do his commandments, Scripture says, that they have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates to the sea. Revelation chapter 22 and verse uh, 14. And the statement here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, not the hearers of the law but though are, just, are just before God, but who? But the doers of the law. These are the ones that are to be justified. We are to do what the Lord commands us to do. God bless you for being here today. The Bible says that we are to gather on the Lord's day, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, to gather around his table, and as often as we do this, we do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. And I know when the Lord comes again, we're going to want to be faithful. We're going to want to be people who have done the commandments of the Lord. Disobedience will cause us to be rejected, destroyed, our names blotted out, blotted out of the Lord's book of remembrance. God, help us today to lay aside the weights that can cause us to be destroyed. And then I would notice with you also indifference. Indifference is something that gets to a lot of people who claim to be Christians. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus said, If any man come after me, let him deny himself. It's not just a matter of confessing faith in Christ. We have a tendency to want to make life easy for ourselves and to make things pleasant for ourselves. And he's saying we are to deny ourselves and take up his cross and follow after him. What kind of cross do we take up? I've seen church bulletins publish an article from time to time called the, the Padded Cross. We have padded pews, and there's some people who want to make Christianity as comfortable as it possibly can. You think about the suffering of our Lord, the suffering of the Apostle Paul and Peter and the others. It wasn't easy to live the Christian life, and it isn't always easy for us today. We have to take up our cross and follow him. 
But now think of the church at Laodicea. I would mention, first of all, to you the church at Ephesus in the second chapter where Paul, rather, the Lord says to them as he speaks about the good things they did, he says, I know thy work. And he commends them on a great deal of the things, but he says, I have one thing, one thing against you. One thing against the church at Ephesus. What was that one? Th he says, you've left your first love. They need to go back and do the first work. They need to repent and do the first works. But when you get on down to the church at Laodicea, it wasn't just one thing against them. There weren't any good things the Lord could say about this church. We find him saying, I know thy works. And I'm sure if the Lord were writing to the church at South Florida Avenue, he would say, I know thy works. For some of us it might be embarrassing. He said, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Here was a church that really wasn't on fire for the Lord, but they weren't ice cold either. How do you like your coffee? Some people like cold coffee, some people like hot coffee. I don't know anybody that likes lukewarm coffee particularly. It's just something that is nauseating. And that's what he's saying here about these people. I will spew thee out of my mouth. That which nauseates the Lord will not save our souls. We need to be people. These people thought they were rich and had need of nothing. They were indeed in a wealthy city and had great wealth as a part of the things that they were had available to them. And he says that they were saying that we are rich, we are in need of nothing. That sounds like America almost, doesn't it? At least it used to sound like America and things are beginning to tumble in on us in many, many ways today. But he says that they needed to make some changes. They needed to have ISAV. They were poor and wretched and miserable and blind. They didn't know their own condition. They were in poverty. They didn't know their poverty. They didn't realize their spiritual poverty before God. May God help us today as we look at all of these things to lay aside the weights. There are those who want to carry the world with them carry the blessings of this life with them and be more attached to those things of this life than they are to Christ, to the gospel, and to the Lord's church. That simply cannot afford to be the way that we approach all of this. So God, help us today as we think with regard to these things to be people who lay aside all of the works of the flesh. He said there in Galatians chapters Chapter 6, uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, lay aside these things, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, long list of these things, and says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now most of us say, well, we're not, we don't do all of those things. A person doesn't have to do all of them. There are people who have their pet sins. They try to take their pet sins with them. And he says, lay aside every, not just part of the weights, lay aside every weight and the sun, the sin which does so easily beset us. Some sins are more difficult to give up than others. But all sin can cause us to be lost. Tonight, today, we need to think very seriously about this. As we approach the end of this year and a new year, a lot of people will be making New Year's resolutions. A lot of people will say, I think I need to lose some weight. Or they'll think of various other things that will change them life physically. Let me tell you today, it's the spiritual things that we need to change. We need to make those kind of commitments and not forget them. Not in just a few days find ourselves back where we were before. Lay aside every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us, 
And then notice what he says, run with patience the race that is set before us. Compassed about by a great cloud of witnesses. If you look back to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, he begins back there with Abel and comes on down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and, and all of these great men of the Old Testament, these great people, he says, who subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, stopped the mouths of lions. Here are people that the world was not worthy of these people, and they are witnesses that say to us today that you can do it. It is important. It is worthwhile. And if you miss doing it, you'll regret it for all of eternity. We're to lay aside every weight, the sin which does so easily beset us, and run with patience the race before us, looking to Jesus. Don't focus on the world. Looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. It wasn't easy to endure the cross, but there was joy to Jesus because it was the means of your salvation and my salvation. Today, if you're not a Christian, whatever weight keeps you from obeying the gospel, lay it aside. Come to Christ. Upon the terms of the gospel, confess your faith in him. Turn in repentance from sins. Begin to live the Christian life. You be baptized into Christ. Your sins washed away. A new relationship. Your name written on the Lamb's book of life. And all of the blessings that are a part of that. And if you've wandered from what God would have you to be, no better time to come back into a right relationship with him than to do it now. And our prayer is that you will, that you'll do it now as together we stand and sing.